My name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm your uh, moderator. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute, and I serve on the Silverado Policy Accelerator Board as well. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Nicoletta Giordani, the principal director for global investment and economic security at the U.S. Department of Defense. Immediately to her left is Ezra Hall, senior director, A&D, and critical infrastructure at Global Foundries. And to his immediate left is Stacey Hasty, CEO of U.S. Strategic Metals. So first we're going to hear from Nicoletta. She's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the National Defense Industrial Strategy and DOD's priorities here. And then we'll have a discussion amongst the panel. So Nicoletta, over to you. Thank you, Jamil, for uh, the introduction. I also want to take an opportunity to thank Maureen, Dimitri, and the Silverado team for organizing this panel and for inviting me here this week. It's always uh, exciting and a pleasure. I'm also very excited to have the opportunity to uh, discuss a little bit about how the Department of Defense has been uh, putting some efforts uh, in strengthening the defense industrial base. Uh, and chief among all those efforts uh, is the recent release of the National Defense Industrial Strategy. Uh, so uh, I hope here I'm here today to give you an overview of that strategy and to set the foundation for uh, this morning's discussion and hopefully discussions uh, between today and tomorrow with uh, you know, others of you love to hear your ideas, feedback, and input as well. As some of you uh, may know, uh, a few months ago, uh, beginning of January, we released the uh, first ever National Defense Industrial Strategy. And because we are the Department of Defense, uh, we love acronyms, so we call it NDIS. Uh, the strategy is really meant to um, help guide um, how we build a defense industrial base that's robust, resilient, and modern. And it's also grounded on the def national defense industrial strategy, sorry, national defense strategy uh, as part of the concept of integrated deterrence. Uh, and it's meant to contribute to our global uh, national security and military operations uh, across the world. Uh, the strategy will uh, basically guide the uh, engagements the department has and will have with industry, our allies and partners, uh, and the interagency. It will guide how we develop policies and how we uh, make investments in the defense industrial base over the next three to five years. I think what's important to note of the defense industrial strategy is that it recognizes that economic security and national security are uh, mutually reinforcing, and that America's uh, military superiority depends in part on our economic strength. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, what the strategy also seeks to address is how do we reprioritize and optimize uh, DOD needs and uh, resources that we have to uh, address a very competitive and complex environment. Uh, I mean, I think Maureen did an incredible job highlighting all of that and how we uh, face these challenges from a geopolitical, economic, and technological perspective. The uh, current status of the defense industrial base is the result of decades of uh, policy making and policy decisions. Uh, and some of those uh, you know, uh, have brought us to the state where we are today. So you know, if you think about after the Cold War and the peace dividend, you know, consistent investments in the defense industrial base that decline uh, dramatically. And uh, that caused, you know, the um, industrial base and companies to restructure, uh, that caused shrinking production capacity and consolidation in the market. And now we have a handful of major defense, U.S. defense suppliers. Uh, if we think that from 1985 to 2011, even with uh, uh, the Afghanistan and the Iraq war, uh, the defense budget as a percentage of GDP went from 5.2%, sorry, 5.8% to 3.2%. And so that caused uh, uh, not only a contraction uh, within the um, defense market uh, with companies, but also a corresponding reduction of the uh, associated workforce by two thirds of the total workforce. Uh, and that, I know that's a th theme that will continue to come up and came up yesterday as well. You know, how we continue to attract and, uh, and uh, build the talent we need to support the defense industrial base. But moreover, like uh, if you think about globalization, uh, the US approach to just-in-time inventory, outsourcing, right? We have shifted uh, uh, production capacity and capabilities to countries that have become our adversaries. So uh, that to say that 
where we are today, we, we have a defense industrial base that doesn't fully possess the capacity, capabilities, and resilience uh, to satisfy you know, current and future uh, production needs and also the ability to adjust quickly and to be agile to how you know, major conflicts and the way in which we fight um, with our adversaries continues to evolve. So the NDIS uh, uh, really focuses on four strategic priorities. So the first one, we have heard this a lot yesterday, the resilience of the supply chain, uh, you know, that will become probably the most popular word of the week, uh, uh, the days that we are here, but uh, you know, what it really means is that we are focusing on securely produce products, uh, technology, services uh, at speed and scale and cost. Uh, through a number of different initiatives that can go from uh, you know, ensuring that we have adequate stockpile to incentivizing industry to uh, you know, invest in a surge capacity, either by you know, sharing in partnership those investments, uh, doing joint sharing of uh, uh, R&D or development, also risk sharing with, uh, with the government. Uh, we also focus quite a bit on supply chain illumination. Uh, we heard yesterday a number of government agencies are focusing on supply chain risk management and building centers around that. Uh, that follows really the um, supply chain, America supply chain executive order 1417 that was issued by the president in 2021, requiring to start looking into um, the supply chain of critical uh, sector and critical technologies and identifying the risks. Uh, uh, you know, and risks can be multiple from uh, having adversary countries to dominate or to basically own the supply chain of a particular technology or market to having single point of failures to uh, not having the adequate workforce to support that particular supply chain for that particular critical technology. And that uh, study also led to uh, ident identifying uh, policy recommendations or either actions uh, to basically address those gaps. Uh, and a lot of those uh, uh, gaps are currently also being uh, uh, addressed through um, uh, government investments through the Defense Production Act and the Industrial Base uh, uh, um, Analysis and Sustainment Program. On uh, workforce uh, uh, readiness, like the second uh, pillar of our strategy, uh, you know. Some, uh, some points have been mentioned before, but the concern here is that we keep talking about onshoring and friendshoring. The problem is that we lost a lot of the manufacturing talent, uh, you know, from trade skills to sometimes, you know, uh, PhDs in engineering and, and, all, and all the spectrum in between to other countries. And it's not just a US issue, it's a Western world issue, right? Because of labor's costs and other reasons. But the point is that as we try to invest in onshoring and friendshoring, in order to be able to sustain that, not only do we have to make sure that there is the demand, especially on the commercial side, that's what kind of DOD cares about because we are often like a very small part of the market share, right, overall market share. So we wanna make sure that there's valuability on the commercial side as well, but with that, uh, we need to make sure also that we have the talent and the workforce uh, to be able to su sustain and support that. And quite a bit of investments uh, are being made at the Department of Defense to ensure that we attract, educate, and train the workforce we need. Acquisition flexibility. I'm not gonna talk about you know, acquisition reform here. I think you know, we have had enough over the years, uh, but it's really like a focus on uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at existing authorities. We have so many, are we using them, uh, you know, sufficiently? Are we, do we have dormant authorities that we're not uh, leveraging? Uh, how about our contracting strategies? We have so many uh, opportunities and, and uh, channels to, uh, you know, develop new contracting strategies. We are just not doing enough to focus on that. Or for example, uh, you know, how do we broaden the platform standards? Uh, and not only will increase interoperability within the United States, but also with our allies and partners abroad. We are, you know, we don't live in our own world anymore. We are part of the global supply chain. So we need to start thinking about how we can be more agile and move very quickly by leveraging not only our capabilities, but those are our allies and partners as well. And then the last one, uh, I just want to spend a, a minute on uh, economic deterrence. Uh, uh, that's the last pillar that actually, if we can go to the next slide. Um, 
So, you know, when we were looking a little bit about, uh, you know, how we need to approach, um, in a way, how we reform the policy around the fence industrial base, we, we were looking at authorities that we have within uh, industrial base policy, acquisition sustainment within uh, the Department of Defense, and then more broadly in the interagency, especially, you know, with my organization, we are part of uh, uh, several interagency committees to protect uh, and counter, you know, um, uh, um, uh, foreign adversaries, especially uh, with our serial capital, kind of interjecting with our defense industrial base, uh, not only stealing, uh, you know, our technology and innovation through investment, but also through cyber threats. But uh, we realized very quickly that we didn't have a, a sense of the full spectrum of the tools that needs to be used in order to be able to counter our adversaries uh, from an economic security perspective. And we're talking about really countering, you know, economic statecraft and economic coercion. And so, uh, you know, it's not just the focus on, uh, uh, hey, how do we ensure that we continue to prioritize fair and efficient market practices uh, to support our defense industrial ecosystem, for the US and for our allies and partners, but also what actions do we put in place from an economic deterrence perspective so that you know, we continue to have access to global resources, uh, technology, innovation, and we deter our adversary from uh, restricting or even denying access uh, to those resources. Uh, and that's how we conceptualize the um, economic deterrence uh, uh, strategy. Uh, that's kind of nested within the broader economic security, um, you know, uh, concept, uh, which, you know, I can go into the details, but not this time, maybe later, which is much broader, and it's a whole government approach. Uh, various agencies have various missions on economic security. You know, Treasury has their own mission, uh, Commerce has their own, and so on. Uh, DOD is really focusing on uh, uh, economic deterrence and countering economic statecraft and integrating that domain with all the other five domains that we use in war fighting to ensure that we are taking that into account because it, it is part of how we do warfare, you know, nowadays and going forward. So some of the actions that are here, like I think, you know, some are kind of very familiar to all of you. We have a lot of protective measures like a uh, we use the CFIUS uh, uh, committee, we use the Team Telecom committee, uh, we use the uh, New Information Communications Technology and Services committee. Uh, but how do we go from just uh, using the protective measures to take a more proactive approach? I think the recent Alban Investments Executive Order that kind of focus on uh, um, reviewing and overseeing uh, uh, you know, investment capital that flows into uh, countries that are our adversaries, particularly in technologies that we really care about, such as artificial intelligence, microelectronics, uh, quantum system and computing, uh, but also thinking about how do we start um, thinking more broad than just the United States with our allies and partners. Uh, so, for example, on supply chain, uh, we are at this point, um, sign 17 supply of security agreements which allow us to have priority over our you know um, contracts uh, with our partners abroad and vice versa in times in time in times of emergency creating if you will alternative supply chains that we can use when we can uh, you know um, support the uh, the demand uh, within the United States for our warfighters uh, but also uh, agreements on a joint uh, research and development, uh, joint production, uh, think about AUKUS, uh, think about MTIB, the Quad, and uh, uh, also our engagement with NATO. We have ramped up our engagement with NATO quite significantly over the last several months. Uh, as you, um, this is not something that just the United States is thinking about. The European Union has issued an economic security strategy and a defense industrial based strategy. Uh, NATO, uh, one of the top priorities for the next couple of years is to develop uh, an economic uh, deterrence, an economic statecraft uh, strategy against our adversaries. So we are working very closely with our allies and partners uh, 
to do so, and particularly with some of the Indo-Pacific Indo partners, such as Japan, that was the first one to come up with an Economic Security Act that uh, reflect very similarly to what we are doing currently uh, within DOD, so we are really in lockstep in terms of how we are approaching the problem. So I think, I can't really see the clock, but I've been told to make sure I stay on time. Okay, I think I'm probably, have to yield my time back to Jamil, right? Okay. Whenever you're ready. I am ready. All right, Thank let's you. do it. All right. All right, so um, Nicoletta, thanks a lot for, uh, for those comments. And you know, I think one of, the, um, one of the interesting things you mentioned um, as part of your conversation was you talked about economic deterrence, you talked about economic statecraft. These aren't usually words we hear from the Department of Defense. You might hear it from commerce, you might hear it from state, although they don't necessarily use the words deterrence. How, why, is, why is DOD in this business at this point? Does it, is it, does it make sense? Is it the right approach? Um, and what, what put DOD in this place? Uh, thanks, Jamil. That's a, a very good question. So, uh, I mean, the way we see economic security, we see economic security being at the forefront of national security. And it's increasingly becoming one of the key pillars of the US war fighting advantage, especially as our adversaries are, are favoring like a gray zone tactics over kinetic conflict, right? If we think about uh, strategic competition, another buzzword, the way we look at strategic competition is not something that you know um, aligns with traditional conflict, but it's where adversaries are trying to have an advantage over the over someone else, uh, and they aim for that advantage, and they push far enough but uh, to uh, gain superiority at the same time, not too far to um, push the adversary into a war of, a war of choice or a war of necessity. Yeah. So that game is played every day, right? So we had to think about our five domains of war fighting, like our air, land, sea, uh, information cyber and space, uh, and had to add an element of economic statecraft and economic in, in, in a way to counter economic coercion. We know that China has engaged in those behaviors uh, in several ways, uh, not just with the United States, uh, but you know more strongly with other countries, like um, with South Korea, for example, when they host. Uh, um, uh, ballistic missile system for the U.S., you know, suddenly the tourists from China to South Korea stopped, right? They did the same with Australia when Australia was calling them out on COVID. Uh, they stopped, you know, importing their products. Uh, and we know what happened with Lithuania when they opened a liaison uh, office with Taiwan. Yeah. So as we are looking at all these situations, uh, we know that's just a way to basically gain a, a superiority and advantage. Yeah. So... Uh, when we look at DOD and our authorities, like I said, I think because uh, uh, the way Congress uh, does things uh, with the executive branch in the United States, we know that a lot of authorities are, you know, um, uh, I say broken in uh, various uh, departments and agencies. Yeah. We have seen that with the supply chain yesterday, right? Sa similarly with economic security, we found our niche, and uh, you know we call economic deterrence. But really, we are looking especially at the commercial technologies, seeing the dual use of commercial yeah. technologies like a biotech, yep. pharmaceutical, particularly AI, right? And and so we are the dual part of that you know, dual use, right? We have this means to understand, uh, you know, how uh, they can be used for military purposes. How do we uh, counter that? How do we protect our technologies? So that's kind of the area that the department has decided to uh, play. Uh, but we are also working very closely with our interagency partners because uh, economic security is a whole of government approach. Yeah. And at the same time, because we need to bring our allies and partners with us, yeah. uh, I was mentioning earlier the efforts that are going on with the European Union, uh, with uh, uh, Japan and other countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific, and uh, Canada as well. So I think all these countries are really stepping forward on developing their defense economic security uh, policies. And you know we're working very closely yeah. with them. Well, you know, Ezra and Stacey, I know, I know we've seen other countries, China in particular, use uh, the semiconductor space, um, use uh, the strategic metal space, uh, critical minerals, uh, to, to engage in sort of what I think, what I think um, Nicoletta is describing as a form of economic warfare. Um, and it, you didn't say it quite, Nicoletta, but I, I hear you might be leaning towards maybe economics and the international economic system is potentially another domain of warfare. You didn't say it. 
Uh, but I'm interested, Ezra, in your thoughts. So, you know, you're a global founder. He's one of the leading, uh, you know, designers of, 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 of uh, or, or, or builders of, of, of high-end uh, and, and critical chips. Talk to us about this space. Talk to us about whether you see this economic warfare going on. And if it is taking place, what's the role of a, what is a trusted foundry? What's the role of a, of a, of a trusted foundry? Yeah, really fabulous to be here today. Uh, thanks to the event organizers. Just a, a fabulous uh, opportunity to engage in important discussions. Uh, first, a, a bit about semiconductors. So Global Foundries is a pure play wafer foundry. We build the chips that are in all of our devices. Your smartphone has a multitude of chips in it from Global Foundries made in the small state of Vermont where we lead on RF chips. Thank you. And these systems, our phones, our computers, this microphone, uh, all of these systems, including jet fighters and weapons, use a multitude of chips, chips that are built in a wide variety of technologies. All of those are essential. No one technology meets all needs. Uh, just like your car, you have round wheels. They're not square. Round wheels work very well. And some technologies are very good for high voltage, high current, other technology. And, and that's necessary for battery packs, for, for controlling the charge on those batteries and keeping them from exploding. Uh, and you need processors that are built in the most advanced, leading edge, deeply skilled CMOS technologies. All of these chips are essential. And, and what we've heard yesterday and what we've seen today in the data presented is China is investing deeply in creating capacity and overcapacity in semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, by 2030, they will have increased the 10 nanometer and larger technology node sizes by 63% whereas the U.S. will increase by about 12 to 13 percent. Even with our multi-billion dollar investments? Even with our multi-billion dollar investments. So what does this mean? This means that they will uh, command most of the supply for most of the chips going into most of our systems. Today, more than 90 percent of demand worldwide is on those technology node sizes. It's very important that we build the smaller node sizes as well, but most of the world and most of the systems use the larger node sizes. Yeah, Ezra, real quick on that. So people, people always focus on the, on the sort of the small, the advanced chips. Right. Is that really the biggest concern? All chips are important. Yeah. So the, the, the point is that we need all of it, and we have to be very deliberate about ensuring that we don't lose control of the chip manufacturing for, for our systems that we care the most about. Defense for national security, critical infrastructure, power grid, energy distribution, communications. Right? Many, of, many of us now rely upon wireless networks for our data connectivity to, to power the fabric of our economies, economic security. With a de minimis amount of the supply coming out of the US for wafer manufacturing, choose your percentage, 12%, 13%, 14%, it's still a small amount. We should be focused on ensuring that we use that capacity that we have to fabricate the things we care the most about. Yeah. Those are chips that go in defense. Those are chips that go into critical infrastructure. We need to be deliberate about driving that demand. In that way, we can use what we have for our capabilities to get the most return and the most protection. Why? We heard yesterday a very uh, frightening scenario uh, where if China uh, takes control of Taiwan, uh, that there could be a distraction in the U.S. by causing major disruption. Has anyone in the audience heard of an electromagnetic pulse weapon, EMP? Okay. So this is a high-altitude nuclear blast, which causes a, a massive electromagnetic pulse. What does that do? It causes the electronic devices to cease working, from cars to phones to everything we use in a wide swath of the U.S. You don't need that anymore. What you need are compromised electronics. We heard yesterday about ship-to-shore cranes being compromised. We have billions of devices that all of us have in our households and in the fabric of our society. Those devices are vulnerable to software attacks on the firmware and software that's on those systems. Those systems are also vulnerable when we have chips, chips that can have hardware vulnerabilities built into them. So we have to care. We have to care about how those are designed, manufactured, tested, packaged, and put into systems. And we need to ensure the security of all of those elements such that we can have confidence that those cannot be easily disrupted by adversaries and nation state actors. So we need to be very deliberate about which systems we use our capabilities for and, and our allied nation friends to leverage their capabilities as well in partnership to secure this nation and our allies. 
So Stacey, uh, we, you know, we just heard from Ezra a real interesting description about how small a percentage of the market in semiconductors and, and wafers uh, the U.S. has today. Talk to us about our position in strategic metals. Are we similarly reliant on foreign actors? Um, if so, how do we get that back? What are companies like yours doing, uh, like Global Foundries in the semiconductor and the wafer space, what are companies like yours doing to address that reliance if it, if it exists in the strategic metals, critical minerals space? We know the answer. <laughs> Well, we all know the issues at hand, and yes, they are. Um, China is got a stronghold on all the battery metals, uh, 80, 90 percent plus being processed in, in China. We all know the reasons why. Um, the competitive edge they have for various, all the reasons that we have to, you know, obviously in the U.S. we have to comply with a lot of regulation. We have to satisfy a lot of shareholders, a lot of lenders, and there's no processing done in the United States yet. And we have been working on this now for seven years, and we will be in production uh, next year. Uh, it's been a, a long road, but our site's fully permitted to do the processing of uh, these critical metals, which are uh, um, cobalt, nickel, uh, lithium. And um, it is, we need a can-do attitude more. We need collaboration. OK, yeah. but what we're doing is we will be in production uh, next year and we anticipate that uh, we can continue to grow as long as we can secure the capital. We, we're fully funded for this phase. So, you know, we're hopeful that um, there's more winners in this space, just not us. There's room for a lot of people in this space and there's a lot of uh, sites under construction now. And uh, we need to see some success, some success stories. And fortunately, the DOE and the DOD are stepping up yeah. and helping, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. So tell us about that, Nicoletta. You know, uh, DOD plays a big role in this space. You guys have authorities like the Defense Production Act um, and the like, uh, where you can help uh, you know, with, with semiconductor manufacturing, wafer manufacturing, with strategic metals uh, and critical minerals. What, what is DOD doing in this space, and how does it relate to what other agencies like DOE, Commerce, and the like are also doing um, in the space? Yes, yeah, so now we have several programs. So, so you mentioned the Defense Production Act, so that's been very active, especially over the last uh, um, couple of years. Like uh, last year, we, you know, we invested a billion dollars in some of these critical areas. Uh, uh, particularly, like uh, we are now, uh, we uh, began um, what we call the mine to magnet uh, uh, supply chain effort. Uh, we invested uh, over $400 million, 450, I think, on basically uh, securing access to rare earth materials. Uh, they go into magnets that uh, support our major weapon systems, right? We're also uh, investing uh, um, in uh, batteries, like uh, through the uh, Inflection Reduction Act, we got uh, 250 million uh, last year, uh, dedicated particularly to uh, batteries materials, uh, and then through the um, through the Ukraine supplemental, we got another 500 million. The most recent one. Yes. Uh, so we uh, received another 500 million that was, uh, uh, you know, dedicated to battery materials such as nickel and cobalt as well. Then uh, we work very closely with uh, uh, DOE uh, on uh, batteries investments. DPA is also being used quite extensively for microelectronics. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and we focus predominantly on uh, uh, equities that DOD cares about. So, as I was speaking about, some of the legacy microchips that in our world usually last decades. Right? I'm usually, like sort of foundational. Foundational, uh, legacy, state of practice, uh, uh, you name it, right? But I, I think you got my point. Uh, we focus particularly on uh, radiation hardware microelectronics, uh, and Ezra uh, spoke about. Trusted microelectronics through the Trusted Foundry program, uh, which you know, as you know, DoD has access to, other agencies have access to, but we have worked very closely with our partners here in industry through that program, and we are looking into also alternative ways beyond that program for uh, you know what we call uh, commercial microelectronics to yeah. see how we can uh, develop policies 
to uh, make sure they're trusted, or we find alternative ways through the methodology of the production process to make them trusted. I think the security of those microchips, what Ezra was alluding to, is clearly uh, something we really care about. Yeah. Uh, we also have, uh, we came out with a, a defense industrial base cyber strategy, a little unrelated, but related to, uh, you know, security. Absolutely. With CIO, and so, uh, you know, I can't get into a lot of details of that, but that's kind of something that we are implementing to ensure that, you know, we continue to protect some of these technologies as well. Yeah. So that's kind of some of the programs that we yeah. are working on. Well, you know, Stacey and Ezra, it seems like there's a lot of alignment between where DOD is and where your companies and organizations are. Uh, we only have we only have nine minutes left, so I want to get a little edgy, right? How's the cooperation with the government going, right? I mean, there's a lot of money, billions and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they're 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 spending some of that. Um, uh, Stacey, I'll start with you. How, how what maybe I forget how the cooperation is going today. What more could we be doing, or what could we be doing better um, in terms of on the industry side and on the government side to move this ball forward? I mean, you can't move fast enough. Um, you know, we got 96% of, of battery metals being processed in China. You know, you've got you've got 12% of the of the wafer supply here in the United States. 53% of of, of, of of foundational chips, uh, or 63% in China. Stacey, talk to me about what, what what could we be doing better in that public-private partnership we all talk about. Well, I mean, the programs. Uh to date with the DOE and the DOD, they're a good start, okay? Uh, but it is a work in process, okay? You, you know, we'd like to see deployment of the funds faster. We'd like to see more flexibility, uh, you know, when you're- You want your tax dollars back? <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, we like to see the flexibility because when you are doing this, you, you, you're doing continuous improvement even as you're doing construction. And there's always going to be changes. Okay, yeah. and sometimes you know the government doesn't like change. If you award money for something, you want it to be built exactly that way. But anyway, that that's that's part of what we can do. But honestly, with the battery metals and the refining and the mining into this, there needs to be more alignment with the government agencies. What do you mean? Uh, specifically between the EPA and the DOE and the DOD. You're okay. concerned that 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 regulations continue to get in the way of that? Yeah, they're getting in the way of that. They, yeah. they absolutely they are. Uh, you know, the, um, the initiatives of the administration are starting to conflict. Mm. Um, there needs to be more alignment. There needs to be some common ground between the EPA on um, when it relates to permitting, when it relates to clean water, when it relates to, uh, uh, you know, the air programs. And uh, they're conflicting each other. Yeah. Okay. So that's why we're having these issues. That's why we're behind the eight ball right now. And... There just needs to be some common ground. I'll cite you one specific example. I'm not going to detail on it. We're the only cobalt operation in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we are currently mining surface tailings. The, the old, the old waste, the old waste from this old mine site that we reopened. We call it remining. Okay, and the EPA is trying to suggest to us that our cobalt re, uh, levels for for uh, water should be the toughest in the United States. Tougher than anybody else in our state, tougher than anybody else in the United States. I thought they wanted you to get the cobalt out. That's what I thought too, but it's very difficult, okay? There needs to be some common sense, common approach between all the regulators and, and these initiatives need to be uh, aligned. Ezra, do you, do you guys face similar challenges on permitting and the like um, when you're building these large scale factories? Do you do you need more help or, or and, and if so or not, where do you see uh, the need for better alignment between government and industry? With regards to permitting, it's one of those areas where our adversaries and competition can outpace us. They can do. They don't worry about quickly. it. They don't worry about it. Yeah. <clears throat> so what, what we've taken for an approach at Global Foundries is being proactive. For example, for our recent uh, award of Chips and Science Act, Chips, Chips and Science Act grant, we proactively uh, procured rights for land and permitting for that land for expansion of our facility in Malta, New York. Pre-permitted, so you mean? Pre-permit yeah. to work ahead of the schedule to get uh, ourselves positioned to be able to act quickly. Doesn't always solve the problem. It doesn't it's, always it's, solve it. Your, your facility is pre-permitted as well, right? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to circle back to uh, the first question you asked, yeah, which please. is, what can we do better? Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we value highly the Chips and Science Act. It is a terrific incentive mechanism. Uh, it will help uh, increase supply. I spoke about demand. Yeah. I think we need to monetize security, security being assurance of supply, because if you yeah. can't buy the parts, you can't make the systems. And then making sure that those chips are uncompromised. 
I will. How do we do that? The way we do that, Nicoletta mentioned the Trusted Foundry program, yeah. which uh, deeply protects confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those three factors, the CIA triad, are critical to ensuring that chips are uncompromised, and it spans every stage of design and manufacturing. That is a critical method. We need to ensure that the chips that we most care about in this nation use security, and we need to monetize it so that we all care about it. What do you mean by monetize it? Monetize it meaning when the DOD is making acquisitions, that the programs, they have to put out evaluation criteria for determining awards. Those awards should include uh, a requirement for the sourcing of the chips that go in these systems, a requirement for the security of those chips, such that the defense primes, the ecosystem that's responding to those RFPs can legitimately add that security as a metric of strength in their proposal and it will be evaluated as a winning criteria. Kind right of what happened with battery metals in, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Exactly. Very controversial in Europe. But absent that, which it's not in these RFPs today, yeah. a performer who's proposing, if they add security and they add cost to implement that security, they're going to they're lose the bid. They're going to lose the bid, so they don't do it. So we need to monetize what we care about so that it's a metric that yeah. everybody is driving to improve. What about that, Nicoletta? How, how, how is the work going with other agencies like the EPA and, and the interagency process um, on, on the, co the concerns that Stacey raised? And, and what about this idea that, um, that, that DOD could prioritize awards, even if they're a little more costly, uh, for folks that use trusted foundries, um, uh, for, for bidders that, uh, that, that require a certain amount of their chips to, and wafers to be built here in the U.S.? So, uh, or, or allies. Yeah, so in terms of like... Uh, you know, we, we work very actively in, in the interagency, right? Sure. Uh, so when it comes to the Chips and Science uh, Act, like uh, we work very closely with uh, Commerce uh, and other agencies in the implementation of the initiatives in the, uh, the Act. For those areas where we are the primary stakeholder, we do, uh, we do that through uh, DOD, through the Commons Network, right, to incentivize the... Um, Basically, not only the research and development, but the lab to fab, you yeah. know, uh, um, uh, process, uh, right? So we have uh, a, a direct, uh, let's say, um, uh, say into that one. But then, with the rest of the act and the and the funds, uh, we work very closely with other agencies, uh, and so as uh, in batteries as well. You know, we we work with DOE, DOE as the lead on that, but. DOD has uh, an important uh, stake into the uh, into the batteries uh, uh, sector, and uh, we we just issued. Uh um, well, it was a year ago, like at the first uh, DOD battery strategy. So we do have uh, areas that we are concerned with, and through the Defense Production Act and uh, IBAS, uh, we have made some direct investments, uh, uh, you know, in into batteries and also into the rare earth materials uh, that we uh, we care about. We think are critical to our DOD's equities. Do you, do you, would there be value? I don't, know, I don't know if you have one, but be, would there be value in a national security waiver to certain regulations? to allow uh, rap, more rapid construction of fabs and, and, and mining operations that for, for technologies and capabilities that are particularly critical to the United States? I mean, I think that uh, it's important to continue to look at authorities uh, and, uh, and work with Congress uh, and, uh, and the administration to figure out what's the best way to uh, address our issues, right? So some of these uh, bills, some of these authorities are being issued because there is a need and there is a, 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 um, a national security need, but they don't necessarily, you know, were uh, grown uh, in an organic or holistic way. So I think what uh, we do, at least within industrial base policy, I'm in constant contact with uh, the Hill. Like I'm, you know, I speak with them like uh, very regularly, yeah. but also with the administration as well and at the interagency because of the missions I have. And so that dialogue is there, and I think that's kind of the best way to address some of these issues. Right. All right, well, thank you all uh, for being here. And uh, audience, please let, help me thank the panel.